uh, the same approach that I took with the others that I had been responsible for would be the same I do this morning. So the plan will be to look at what is the 10th commandment or which is the 10th commandment and then specifically what is required in it and what is forbidden in it. And your handout is broken up into those three major sections. So on the empty lines under each section, you could write these points. And any text or illustrations that we discuss or notes you want to write, you can put them underneath those points. Okay. So on the handout or in your Bible, preferably in your Bible, let's turn to Exodus 20 and read verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. With this first section, what I want to do is knowing either the grammar or the definitions of these words hit on some major points through observing that commandment, that verse, and begin to explain what it means in its context or in in its place that we read it, and then we'll actually get into after that what's required and what's forbidden. And before I begin to explain the, the effect that this study and teaching should have on your heart is remember the purpose of the law. The law is meant to do multiple things. For believers, it is a rule of life. It's not something that we gain our right standing with God with. Uh, It's something that comes to us in the hands of our mediator Uh, who has already satisfied the requirements to perfection and the judgments to perfection from what the law required of us. And as believers, having been given life and title to heaven, God uses the law to guide our steps, to command our way. You can't remove the authority of the law any more than you can make God not God. So the gospel in no way undermines or frees us from the authority of the law. In fact, it gives us motives and strength by the gospel to keep it. And also, Another purpose is to convict and expose our sin, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin, and through the law, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. So it should have another effect to expose your heart before God. Not that you would, as a believer, believe yourself to be condemned, but that as a believer you would see rightly remaining sin and by the gospel, be motivated to repent of it. Unbelievers this morning, uh, I beg you to listen and to examine yourself in the light of God's law. And let's go into this verse. First of all, like I had said with the first commandment and now with the tenth, it is a command. The mood is imperative. It's not indicative. So God is is commanding us to not covet. It is not um, a, a desire of God merely. Or like someone that's super uh, exceeding the requirements of God that God commands our hearts to not covet. Uh, And I think of that way because when you either in your own life or in evangelism with unbelievers, we all have a standard of righteousness that is too low. And when we think we have one that's superior to God's, it's a man-made tradition and it's still too low. 
And many people, when they hear about the commandment, you shall not covet, can think, does God really require that in the heart? Yes. And I want to go into it. And just to remind you, in Colossians 3, verse 5 and 6, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, covetousness, evil desire, passion, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. It's right there in a list of fornication. We don't think of covetousness like often we think of fornication or murder. But this is one of the Ten Commandments. So do not allow your heart by God's grace to be deceived into thinking that God's standard is lower than what it is. Okay, and the next is it focuses on the heart. So when you look at the commandments, Exodus 20 For example, you shall not steal. That's the deed that's being written there. You shall not commit adultery. That's the deed. It does, of course, the commandment goes to the heart. But the way that it's published in Mount, from Mount Sinai with those other two I just read, it's focusing on the deed. This commandment doesn't even start downstream. It just starts right at the, the spring and says, you shall not covet in the heart. The Hebrew word for covet in the Exodus verse is uh, spelled C-H-A-M-A-D. And uh, I pronounce that kamad or shamad. And as a verb, it means to desire, desire greatly, or set your desire upon. So, you could tr translate it that way. You shall not desire, desire greatly, or set your desire upon your neighbor's house, and so forth. So there's qualifications and motives and goals and things coming into play with these desires towards others that's sinful. Particularly like with another man's wife or possessions, it's very easy for us to understand how we shouldn't set our desire upon that because it's not ours. But what about other things? Like, uh, let's say you're single and you desire to be married. You know, um, Is it good to desire marriage? Yes. Uh, but can you covet and have evil desire with reference to marriage? Yes, you can. So now... In order to define the difference in that area, we have to get into what are motives and what are the goals and other implications or factors. Um, but the word covet means desire, desire greatly, or set your desire upon. It doesn't mean admire. Um, I could admire someone's car and that not be coveting. But if... I desire that car out of discontentment, that's covetousness. If I set my desire upon that one or one like it and I have no means to attain it. Uh, the word often has a sense of pleasure or delight in its usage. Uh, the word is used in Scripture for good desires and evil desires. I thought that was very interesting. So the word covet, kamad, can be used to reference a good desire. So here in this text, it's very clear. It's evil. And in fact, in Psalm 68, 16, Uh, it says, Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Covets. God covets to dwell in. So, God has this same Hebrew word where He's referencing His desire to dwell there. That shows you that there can be a, you can use this word to talk about good desires. 
Um, and also the same word gets used though with Achan, who confessed that he coveted. And they're very clear he sinned because it was forbidden that he should desire the, the things that he desired like the wedge of gold. Um, if you think about like a water, a water in creation, it starts at a spring and then it goes all the way out to the mouth of a river. Some commandments, when they're given in their published form, focus on the mouth of the river. And God expects you to go upstream from His Word and learn how that commandment is disobeyed at its source. But when He publishes this commandment, He, he goes right to the spring. Okay, uh, next. It focuses on your neighbor's possessions. So in the commandment, Let me read that again, the part of it. Your neighbor's wife, his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. A neighbor is anyone made in the image of God. There was a man that came and tested Jesus and said, Who is my neighbor? And he gave him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because the man sought to justify himself by categorically saying certain people were disqualified from being his neighbor. So he didn't have to love them. It's everyone, including your enemies. And it's looking at, it focuses on your neighbor's possession. So somebody might say, well, what about a wife or a husband? How can you say that's a possession? Well, in one sense, they're not property. But in another sense, that is her husband. That is his wife. So there is a possessive there because of the union that they have in the covenant of marriage. And next, it is exhaustive. It isn't exhaustive in this published form in all ways. But it's exhaustive in the sense that it, it says at the end, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So as we look at what God forbids us to set our desire upon with our neighbor, He, he doesn't just give us a, a representative list and expects us to broaden that. He just, he just broadens it Himself. Nothing. I want you to be real clear about that. I don't want even you have to even draw that implication out from a representative list. I'm going to tell you outright, nothing. And it is rooted in discontentment. I spelled that wrong. It is rooted in discontentment. This is not a direct observation from this verse. It's an inference that I'm making. And I want to uh, demonstrate that. But covetousness finds its root in discontentment. You have to first take where you are in life, what you've been given in life, and first be discontent with that before you can look elsewhere to find value in something else that you ought not. And to give you an illustration, uh, uh, we could go to Eve. Adam and Eve had everything. Upright, innocent, fellowship with God and all of creation. And it wasn't until she doubted God and became discontent through the devil's lies with what God's provision was, and his, not only in what His bounty was, but in His restriction of that tree, His wisdom. She became discontent with God's wisdom and then set her desire upon the forbidden fruit. If you look at Ephesians 5, And I'm going to read verses 3 to 7. 
Um, and what, I, what I'm hoping you'll see here is the relationship between discontentment and covetousness. So let me read this. But fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. In this text, you see a list at the beginning. Fornication, uncleanness, or covetousness. And then it goes further and talks about filthiness, foolish talking, and jesting. And then after he says, but rather giving of thanks, so put off these, put on this, he says, because you know this, that fornicator, unclean, covetous, who is an idolater, he repeats the same list. Let no one deceive you. So, in this text, you have a list. I know that there's an expansion of even foolish talking and getting into more specifics, but you can see clearly that pattern. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. In the middle there, there's what God desires, giving thanks. And then after it, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. It's like a sandwich. And buried at the heart of this is thanks. The only way that you're going to grow in righteousness in this area, by God's grace, through faith, is by putting on thanksgiving and contentment. Putting on the joy of the Lord. If you refuse to heed God's Word by faith and renew your mind with His goodness, with His bounty, with His salvation, with His Son, with His promises, with His forgiveness, His justification, His satisfaction for your sin. It goes on. If you refuse to prize that and grow in thanksgiving for who God is and what He has done for you and will do for you, you're already not going to put off covetousness. So, I get the relationship between discontentment and covetousness here by looking at the opposite of contentment, which is thanksgiving or contentment. Or opposite of discontentment, which is contentment, and that's manifested in thanksgiving. Someone who's content, biblically, is a thankful person. They are overjoyed, and that is the vivification, the putting on of righteousness that uh, equips us to put off these sins. Also, 1 Timothy 6. 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing... With these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. If you can see that relationship between contentment and covetousness. Covetousness is not expressed explicitly here, but if you desire to be rich, that's the essence of covetousness in looking at it from the angle of money. If that person would be content with the food and the clothing that God has given them, the fact that God is with them in His salvation, Timothy in this case, he would be uh, preserved from falling into this desire to be rich. Okay? Any questions in the first section? 
Is that clear? Okay. Amen. Well, let's go to the next section. What is required in the Tenth Commandment? And I'm going to read the, the catechism answer. It's on the handout. The Tenth Commandment requires full contentment with our own condition, with a right and charitable frame of spirit toward our neighbor and all that is his. So I've taken that catechism answer and broken it up into three parts. So contentment with what we have, our spirit towards our neighbor, and our spirit towards the neighbor's stuff. And the catechism uses the, the word condition with our own condition. That means our state, like in what state we're in in life. I'm divorced, I'm single, I am lost my job, I'm rich and doing well at my job, I'm um, you name it. Like, say you're discontent with certain life, like, you know, you want to progress, or um, how would you be able to yeah. distinguish? Uh, well, again, there are good desires. So, the answer to what is God commanding us in this isn't the absence of desire. It's forbidding covetousness which is evil desire and since it's forbidding that we know that whatever the commandment forbids it commands the opposite in the positive way so he commands us to have holy desires good desires and if I have a holy desire to do something um, I wouldn't call that discontentment so uh, if someone did and they explained to me their definition of discontentment and I recognized it to be actually a holy desire that they have, I wouldn't condemn them <laughs> in a sense, like say, that, that's sinful, brother, you shouldn't covet. Um, or be discontent, I would say, you probably would be better off using a different word for your, your longing for knowledge of the Lord, your longing for growth in grace, your longing for uh, uh, a way to provide for your family in a righteous way. Um, discontentment, by definition, here I'll, I'll read uh, a dictionary. Discontent, dissatisfaction. A relentless desire for something more or different. So, um, we should never say we're dissatisfied with what God has given us. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, okay, I hope that helps. Let's look at, oh, I wanted to explain condition. So, condition is the state. It's not just like your current disposition in life or your current place, it, it includes everything like your estate, your possessions. Not only like what you possess physically and materially or virtually like in a bank account, but also what you possess in your skills, talents, size, shape, appearance, everything about who you are is included in that word condition. And they also use right and charitable frame of spirit. Right means upright. Honoring to the Lord. Lawful. Evangelically lawful. And charitable means having this, this disposition to help others. To serve them. And then frame of spirit. So when you have a framework or you frame out something, 
what that's saying is, frame your spirit, construct your spirit in such a way that you are focused on your neighbor with rightness and charitableness. So, frame your spirit and to, to the point where you have a disposition towards your neighbor to be upright with him and charitable to him. So, let's look at that now that I've kind of given some explanation of the, the catechism. First of all, contentment with our own condition. Let's look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So in the context. Remember that the audience of the Hebrews were growing dull and sluggish and they were retreating from New Covenant practice and theology. Um, likely because of incoming or upcoming persecution. So where were they finding shelter? In the Old Covenant ways. Because it had been established through the Diaspora. Many people respected synagogues and you could find protection, so to speak, from persecution in Judaism. And the author recognizes that this is the path to apostasy. Because, not because the Old Covenant was evil in and of itself, it's because it's now been made obsolete and the New Covenant has come. Why return to the shadow when you have the, the fullness and in the midst of there, he gives these strong warnings. And then here in this practical side of the letter, he's giving them moral directions. And with covetousness, I think this is helpful. I think that context helps give why he might bring out that text the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what can man do to me. If you're expecting in faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ and being a disciple in that age to be persecuted to, to great degrees, to, to have this attitude and to be able to boldly say, what can man do to me? Uh, because of contentment and joy in the Lord uh, is modeling for them what kind of spirit they ought to have. But it, do, it doesn't leave us out. This is Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. So it's intended not just for them, but for us since it has been inscripturated. So let us look at it. First of all, he says, let your, co your conduct be without covetousness. This is a, a, a narrow use of the word. It's not pleonexia. It's another uh, Greek word. And afi... I can't remember how to pronounce it. I feel lurgos. But the, it, it's focused on love of money particularly, love of silver. So he's saying, do not be that way. Command you to be without covetousness, but instead do the opposite. Be content with what? With such things as you have. That's the commandment. What's the ground or the reason he gives that commandment? It's the next part. Look, let's look at that. It's because of what God has said. What has God said to His people? He says, I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. Uh, I was listening to a preacher and he was just walking through how God was with Joseph. Um... 
you know, the way that Joseph is treated by his brothers, by Potiphar's wife, he's thrown into prison, and the, I think it was the baker forgets his promise to him. The Lord was with him through every part of it and promoted him according to his providence and did good to his promised people of the seed of Abraham. Um, Try not to miss that. You know, it's like uh, you read a book or you watch a movie or something and there's the climax of this glorious truth or this glorious heroic thing. This is the glorious part of this text is God is with us. Um, That is much cause for you to be joyful and content regardless of what condition or estate you have. This is the one true and living God. All things that exist are are kept by the word of His power. Uh, He is the chiefest of beings. There's no one more worthy than Him. None should be worshipped but God alone. And He stoops and condescends in love and grace and He promises to never leave you. And you only have to look at Christ to see it. Do you see why discontentment is so wicked? It's, it's very evil. And I know that I'm not innocent, and I don't want to sound uh, harmful, uh, but I do want to bring the force of the law uh, as God would have it to be heard. So, look at this text, if you will. The cause for contentment and not being covetous is that God will never leave us. And then in verse 6, he says, so. That's like a therefore. Therefore, because God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, because he said that, therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can happen to me if this happens? What's going to really happen to me if I lose that? Or I don't get that? I will not fear. What's the worst that can happen? You die? That Bible talks about our death as a sleep. As putting off a tent. Death, where is your sting? Um, and I think it's interesting to sh- see how he, he, this promise is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That was the cause of be content and do not uh, covet. And then it becomes the inference for the I will boldly say. Really, that one promise serves as a ground for both things. It's a ground for being content and not covetous, and it's a ground for saying, the Lord is my helper. What is the, what's, why, why would I say, the Lord is my helper? The Lord is my helper. Why would I say that? Because He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What that, that being the double ground actually helps connect the two. Content, you know what contentment looks like? It's not like this humdrum, desireless person that's just kind of, Practice in formality. It's a joyful person. A person that, that uses Scripture and says, the Lord is my helper. It looks like someone that, that would be bold. Okay, I hope that helps. Let's look at the next one. Um, contentment with our own condition. And we have a reason there why. But next... The commandment requires us to have a right and charitable spirit toward our neighbor. If you'll turn to Romans 12, 15. (laughs) 
Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. What's required in the Tenth Commandment? That you have a right, an upright, lawful, and charitable spirit toward your neighbor, toward his person. So when he's rejoicing, and I have an upright and charitable spirit towards him, my disposition and I frame my spirit towards him in such a way, by God's grace through faith, that I want him to be treated uprightly, and I want him's good. And if he's in need, I want to help him. If he's rejoicing, I want to rejoice with him. So this commandment is a commandment that helps us see that aspect of the Tenth Commandment. If you were discontent and you didn't have the opposite of of covetousness, which is um, a right and charitable spirit towards your neighbor, when he rejoiced, you're not going to rejoice. You're going to see his good and know that it's good, see his joy and thanksgiving, and you yourself will not be able to partake with him in that. Because your spirit is framed towards him, not as the commandment would require, but coming from a position of discontentment, you find it impossible or hard to partake in his joy. And think about it practically, you know, like, what if you have a, uh, more children than someone else? Uh, and you're joyful about your children, and somebody else can't have that many children. Are you able to rejoice with them? Um, somebody gets a promotion, and it's a good thing. Are you able to rejoice with them? If you're covetous and discontent in your heart, you're going to find that hard to do. So the commandment requires us to have a right and charitable spirit toward our neighbor. It goes with weeping too. Because a charitable spirit seeks to help someone in need. To desire that person's good in the Lord. And if they're in trouble and anguish and suffering and weeping, because of your disposition and your contentment in the Lord, your outward focus, your other's focus, and you're able to have compassion and have this charitable spirit of weeping with them. The, uh, the next one is a right and charitable spirit toward all that is our neighbors. And I thought we could look at Genesis 39. One through nine, and I, I think I'm 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 going to hope that you're familiar enough with Joseph and Potiphar that I'm going to skip part of it and start at verse three. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Remember we said that, <laughs> and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was, from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So this is 
a narrative, but what you can see here is the commandment being modeled or exemplified in Joseph in the fact that he is content. He has been given much. He's blessed by the Lord. He's been given great position. Uh, He has authority over everything. His uh, Potiphar's wife seeks to tempt him to sin. And when he enters into that temptation, he comes into it with a heart of thankfulness and a heart of contentment. And because of God's work of grace in his heart and life, when he enters into that temptation, by faith, he thinks clearly. And he recognizes this is a great evil. It's not a minor thing what you're saying. You're, you're, you're speaking very wickedly. If you're discontent and covetous, um, it might manifest itself in particular areas, but you'll enter into temptations and you will not be ready. But he said, I cannot do this great wickedness or sin against God. So he was living in the fear of the Lord and was a content man. And he had the right, upright, and charitable spirit towards Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife. But I'm thinking about Potiphar because Potiphar um, isn't there. He trusts Joseph. And now in the privacy of this conversation and temptation, um, he has a right, upright, and charitable spirit towards Potiphar. Mr. Pete? Sorry. If you think about it, uh, covetousness and um, discontent can also give rise to other sins like uh, jealousy, bitterness, hatred, all sorts of things. Yes. Yes, amen. I think in that... You know, um, that First Timothy 6 chapter, which we didn't read, but it says, you know, selfish, these selfish desires. Let me just read that real quick. First Timothy 6. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many f- foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Um, brothers and sisters, allow me to warn you against covetousness. Beware of it and repent. Repent of what God convicts you today and that you see as covetous. Trust the Lord and remember who God is in Christ and who Christ is and what He's done for you. Put your hope in Him and see the glory of the Lord. And let your heart and mind be renewed through the Word of God, namely the Gospel. And put on contentment and joy. Thank God for what you have. Thank God for what you know. And particularly this fellowship where He will never leave you. See it in its darkest corners. And don't exonerate it. Stop do, let's stop doing that. Uh, let's move to the last point. What is forbidden in the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment forbids all discontentment with our own estate envying and grieving at the good of our neighbor and all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. So again, I broke that up into three parts. First of all, with ourself. Do not be discontent with your own condition. It says a state, I'm combining it. Because I want to go beyond possession. I want to go to, and one of the definitions for the word state is condition. 
So I think they're meaning it broadly. And we know the Bible teaches it broadly. So our own condition, anything about who you are. You know, if someone has a, uh, an appearance that you believe is more attractive than you. Uh, someone has more popularity than you do. Somebody has a higher position than you do. Somebody appears to have influence over others more than you appear. They go to her or they go to him with questions. They don't come to you. Um, whatever you are and wherever you are, be content. And do not be discontent. Let's turn to Luke 12. This is the, the rich man. The, I, was, I, I, sh, I guess I should call him the fool because God says fool. The parable of the rich fool. Verse 13, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, and what I want you to see in here is how the logic of this rich fool is grounded on his discontentment. The certain... The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, those, then who will those, whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In order for him to come to this logical conclusion that the best way to, to take advantage of this situation is to build bigger barns and store it is because he's laying up treasure on earth. He has this desire that is very great and, and causes him to act in a, accordance with it, to build treasure on earth, and he is disregarding treasure in heaven. And because he has this discontent, insatiable, unfulfillable desire for things in this life, the moment he gets more, he thinks, how can I keep it and store it? Also, he, he has a framework of thinking of self. So that pride is, is a, a root of this sin. I will, I will do this, I will store, I will pull down, I will say to my soul. It all came because he's about to lose an inheritance he thinks he has a right to. And whether he's being mistreated or not, he's handling it uh, sinfully by trying to get Christ and leverage Christ's pull and influence to get uh, what he thinks is due him. And Christ makes it clear, that's not my role. There are civil authorities in place for such a thing. The fact that you're coming to me about this and not salvation or other things reveals that you're covetous. All right, and then he goes on into worry. He says, therefore, I say to you, to the disciples, do not worry. Worry is a form of coveting. Don't think that... You know, someone, don't think to yourself when you're anxious and worried about something, and I'm not talking about certain pressures that life brings on you and the, the, uh, the, the weight that you feel in expressing the weight of that. That's not bad. The psalmist does that. But somebody who worries about the unknown and does not seek first the kingdom of God but wonders if they're going to be provided for is practicing a form of covetousness. And they need to return to the Lord and be joyful and thankful for the estate that God has put them in. And if you'll turn to Esther. Chapter 
chapter 5. I want to read about Haman. Uh, chapter 5, verses 9 to 14. So Haman, this is still discontentment with our own condition. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, moreover, Haman said, Besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared, and tomorrow I am again invited by her, along with the king." Yet all this avails me nothing. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. This is an illustration of someone who is discontent with their own condition. It leads to them, they're utterly blind to the bounty of God and His goodness and generosity. Utterly blind. Ensnared and in bondage to this sin. And the moment they see something or think of something that they believe they ought to have, and you see there's the pride. They think they're worth it. You can only see something that's not yours and say, I deserve that if you and of yourself think you're deserving of it and worthy. The pride proceeds there too. But you see it and then you say, i got to have it. I want Mordecai to fear me. I don't want him to have this position where he doesn't fear me like he ought to. I'm not respected enough. And it's proven by the way he speaks. And then his wife and friends consort with him. That's another thing. We need to, like uh, I heard a pastor say this, you know, um, you've got some toddlers, toddlers in a room and you've got one toddler over here that's just been given some toys and playing contently. And you've got another toddler over here playing with some toys. They could even be their favorites. And one toddler looks over his shoulder and sees the other one happy. And throws down his toy and walks over there and peers over his shoulder and then just reaches in and snatches out the toy and runs the other side of the room and then he's all just crying and fighting. That is a manifestation of covetousness. That is sin in our children. I thought that was very helpful because, you know, as I think about, even though I'm not a father, I think about a father like, how is how will I love my children? How will I minister to them justice and mercy? And one of the things that you would do a great disservice, I'm convinced of biblically, is to perceive your children with unbiblical glasses and to try to justify the sins of their heart based on their age. Everybody's child, you know, I don't want to be, I think we have a tendency to want to quickly say, I see it in others, but not me. I see it in their kids, but not my kids. But we need to be have biblical glasses and minister in the fear of the Lord to our children. And their wife approved here of Haman. Zeresh approved. And um, I can't remember the other example that I had, but there was another wife. It just made me think as a spouse or a friend or a co-worker, the relation you have to others. Spouses, employees, 
brothers, sisters, if you see covetousness in your brother or your sister, you are not to help vent that and say, not seek to discern whether or not a desire is covetous and correct and help. Warn, comfort, rebuke as needed, but instead automatically, undiscerningly say, I will justify that desire and say it's good. Now I want to help you. And even if they're wanting something good, but they're coveting it, it doesn't mean forbid them from pursuing what is good, but it will mean help them in pursuing it in a biblical way and then dealing with their heart along the way. Um, And just because you're an inferior in some authoritative, not authoritative, but authority relationship, doesn't mean that you aren't ultimately submitted to God's authority. And when they step outside of God's authority and covetousness, you have a responsibility as a believer or just a person made in the image of God to, to help them with that, to rebuke them of that, to correct them. Uh, we can be approvers of covetousness by not saying anything and actually helping people facilitate it. And it, go, uh, it goes on to, to wrap up, you know, envying and grieving at your neighbor's good. There's, I'll just read the text to you. It would have been James 3, 14 through 16. Uh, the word jealousy there is, uh, it's when someone makes war upon the good it sees in another. And it troubles that good and seeks to diminish it. So when, you, when we practice jealousy, God forbids us to be jealous and envious. Forbids us to make war upon the good of another that we see. And forbids us to trouble that good and to diminish it. And there you see God's name and His commandments. You know, I was thinking about it like, what do the commandments reveal about God? This commandment, when you're discontent with some hard providence... One of the things that you will disregard and you will not be thankful for and you will not remember as you are discontent and covetous is the wisdom of God. God is wiser than you. He's wiser than men. He's given to you what you need. Like, uh, don't be discontent thinking you know better than God. And think about how good He is. Another thing is, is we deny the bounty and goodness of God. And he's powerful. It's like it's saying that God's not powerful to control this. This happened to slip outside of God's control. He didn't bring this to me for my good and his providence. Therefore, I'm discontent. But see how in his commandment he's saying, listen, I'm good. I'm wise. See my name in this commandment. What you have need of is not consist in the abundance of the things which one possesses. It's in me. I'll leave it there. Anybody want to add any questions or, or add any statements? Amen. Let's pray and we'll end. Father in heaven, uh, Lord, thank you for your law. Uh, I know that it helps us to see your good name, for it is good. And it helps us to see our sin, that we might repent. And we praise you, Lord, that there is forgiveness with you, that you might be feared in your Son alone, Jesus Christ. We praise you for him. Thank you, Lord, for satisfying the law and no longer uh, condemning us, but justifying us in him. I pray that you would help us, Lord, in thanksgiving and in remembrance of Christ and faith upon Christ to repent of covetousness in our lives and to grow in contentment and joy and thanksgiving here. In Christ's name I pray, amen.